about apartment living these days, buildings falling down, buildings going on fire, we thought we'd take a bit of a light break. I am with Andrew Mercado, a television historian and a cinema owner. My name's Jimmy Thompson, and this is the Flat Chat Wrap. Andrew. Hi, Jimmy. Welcome to the Flat Chat Wrap. Thanks for inviting me. No, well, you're the guy when <laughs> it comes to knowing about what's been on TV. But first of all, you're a cinema owner. Where, where's this, you own your own cinema? Southwest Rocks, which is halfway between Brisbane and Sydney, out from Kempsey. Beautiful little uh, coastal town. So you have the great advantage of in school holidays having families there and families and kids still go to those cartoon animated films. All right. But because there's a lot of retirees that live in the Uh. town, it's small, but the older audience is the only audience that still will go to the movies every week because they're not streaming. Right. So because the town has families and old people, uh, the, the cinema works. Right. So what have you shown recently? Um, recently, I, I, of course, had Toy Story 4 and The Lion King and all that stuff. For, is that uh, the, the live action? Line? The live action. Is and the it? people love it. They love it. Don't worry about the critics. The one thing I've learned about doing this is critics pretty much all agree with each other. And I can tell you they get it wrong so many times. And I say that as a former movie critic myself. Right, of course. Yeah, I was going to say you're, yeah. you're, oh, you're a bit of uh, betraying the troops there. But uh... If the critics give something to stars, which is pretty much what they gave The Lion King, I could barely find a decent review right. to post online. And that they, that, you know, they often decide this about films. That's when I particularly question people as they exit the cinema. Uh-huh. And I'll say to the kids, what did you think, kids? And then I look at the parents and say, how was it? Yeah. They love it. Oh, right. I, it's it's this weird disconnect. I'm not saying it's a disconnect, and I'm not saying that critics need to change what they do, but I think critics would get a great shock if they went out there and stood outside cinemas, as I've done, and spoke to people as they leave the movie. Yeah. And you'll discover that people don't care about bad scripts or bad <laughs> casting or all those things that we think are as important yeah. as critics. Yeah. People want to go out and have a good time. If they have a laugh and a cry in a movie like Bohemian Rhapsody, yeah. forget about what the critics said about that. Yeah. There was an emotional punch at the ending of Bohemian Rhapsody, unlike anything else I've seen in the last yeah. two years. It made grown men, older men, cry yeah. as they exited the cinema, and they're trying so hard not to show <laughs> it. But I could see the tears plopping onto their shirts. Oh, my God. And that's when you go, wow, there's a, there's a bigger picture that goes on that sometimes critics... Yeah. aren't even bothering to think about. Yeah, they're not looking at it as ordinary viewers. I no. mean, we've all been down that road and have been reviewed. Yeah. I've even been reviewed by somebody who hadn't watched the TV show, <sighs> you know, and, and trashed it, by the way. Yeah, I and, bet. And then didn't realise that they were they were writing the review off the promo. <sighs> uh, and we changed the script in the actual episode. So that's how you knew. That's how I knew <sighs> and phoned up the the newspaper's television editor and said, and here, of course, I got this, well, you can't expect all the reviews to be good. And I said, true, but I do expect people to have watched the TV show before they trashed it. And I had, a, I had a friend in the in the newspaper office who said, who called me and said, I've just seen our TV reviewer being called into the editor's office and the paint is blistering as we speak so that was gratifying but that's not what we're here to talk about can i just say then too in those situations too i'm still a tv critic i always watch two episodes right because so often that pilot episode there's so much money thrown at it yeah um you've really got to watch the next one to see what happens next but sometimes if you're not sure on something go i can't you need to watch i often find you need to watch at least two because the first episode of anything is setting up characters And that's just business. That's just mechanics, really. I'm watching City on the Hill at the moment, which is streaming on Stan. Kevin Bacon. He's a very good actor. He's very good, yeah. Yeah. But that's not what we're here to talk about. (laughs) So we're talking about, first of all, we're going to talk about apartments in television. And obviously the most famous one in Australia is number 96. Yeah. And you are, would it be fair to say you're just a little bit obsessed oh, with that? Ma- I've been massively, massively obsessed with it since it began in 1972 as a kid. I, yeah. I had this 
almost I, I remember the first promo coming on TV and and sa- turning to my parents and saying I want to watch that and my mother using reverse psychology on me a, a few months later saying oh you know one of the ladies at work her little boy watched it and he said mummy I'm bored you can turn it off now I'm going to bed and I said to I don't care <laughs> what that boy said I want to watch it so you know that probably helped fuel the obsession but I as an adult, I can now look back less of a geek and a fan of the show yeah. and, you know, look at what a groundbreaking and revolutionary piece of television it was. And we did things on that TV show here in Australia that the rest of the world didn't do for 20 or 25 years. Well, that is true. I mean, it was shocking in, in many ways. I mean, well, you tell me, what in what ways was it groundbreaking? Well, it was based on Coronation Street. Coronation Street right. was a big success <laughs> yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, and particularly on Australian TV. So that's why they decided on the apartment to do a vertical right. Coronation Street. And because it was an inner city apartment set in Sydney, yeah. um, the network was almost heading for financial ruin. So they decided to gamble big. And right. sometimes in TV, when you do yeah. that, you get yeah. a huge success. And that was the case here. But I think one of the greatest things about it was that they left the writers and the producers to deliver the product. And the producer was an American guy called Bill Harmon. And when the creator of the show, David Sales, said to him, I was thinking of putting a, a gay couple in there. What do you think? Bill Harmon said, uh, give me homosexuality but without any deviation. And I think he got that last one. I think he meant deviancy. Right. But he was making the point that at that time in, uh, on TV anywhere in the world, yeah. the only gays you saw on TV were tragic figures or murdering lesbians or, yeah, you know, right. there was yeah, never yeah, yeah, yeah. a sane, normal guy next door. Yeah. And that's what number 96 did the first regular gay character on tv anywhere in the world yep, yep. and uh i've now realized in the years since that they did the first lesbian characters although they weren't as you know positive oh, depictions right. one of them was a witch for god's sake <laughs> um but they also did the first ever transgender character as played by a real transgender actress who was Carlotta, the legendary showgirl from Lay Girls. She actually went into the show under a fake name. They were trying to keep the storyline that under wraps. Um, And you look back now, and it was only recently when there was all this talk about as trans stories started moving into the mainstream and people start saying, well, hang on, we need you to be a trans actor to play that role. That's when I suddenly realised, my God, Carlotta did this years ago and is getting no credit for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, there was also the very voluptuous blonde. Well, there was Abigail. Abigail, Who played Bev Horton, who was very voluptuous and was Australia's first fair dinkum sex symbol. But in actual fact, in the TV show, she was a virgin. This was the the great thing about (laughs) number 96. Everything that you thought was going on often wasn't. So you would think on paper the gay guy would be this tragic guy. In actual fact, he was a law student, so he ended up being the kind person that everyone went to when they had a problem. And Abigail playing this very wearing see-through tops and being all very sexually liberated. But the truth was that she was a virgin. Um, So it did play with that. The character was a virgin. The character was a virgin, yeah. We can't say anything about the age. <laughs> no, no, no. So, I mean, that was all for its day. Uh, you, you throw in a little bit of nudity there, yeah. and that was really shocking. But to get back to the apartment structure of it, yeah. in terms of a building, I think one of the things you see, Jimmy, on apartment TV shows is that everybody in the building is friends with each other. Yeah. We don't have these situations now where you don't know your neighbours. In an uh, yeah, apartment yeah, yeah. TV show uh, where it's about that apartment, everybody knows each other and is involved in everybody's lives. Yes, and which is not the case in real life. <laughs> no. Well, in some. Some of the older apartments. But, you know... When number 96 started back then, it was the first uh, Australian show of that type. There was really only Homicide and Bellbird. Right. Um, and people couldn't separate fact from fiction back then, some people. Yeah. And whenever a flat would become vacant, people would write in to Channel 10 begging to be to move into <laughs> the building, saying, we're very, very interesting. But what was really going on there was... 
two things, I think. First of all, it meant they liked the characters so much they wanted to be their friends in real life. Yep. But I think there's also, as uh, David Sell, the creator, has figured in the years since, that was the beginning of reality TV. Yeah. The audience yeah. was saying, we want to be a part of this. Yep. It's almost like Big Brother, Find isn't it? Off. You know, it's yeah. heading down that road. Yeah. Then we'll skip on to... Breakers. Yeah. Which is a show was a show that you created? It was the one that I created. And it was funny when you were talking about the first gay characters on television because this comes after Home and Away and, and Neighbours were well established. My wife and I had been walk had been going down to Bondi every weekend to buy an apartment. And looking at all the characters there, I thought there's there's a show here. There's yeah. definitely a show. And then I heard that uh, Des Monaghan had left seven, he'd started up screen time, he was looking for a soap. And I remember driving from Channel 7 in Epping. And by the time I'd got to the cafe where I was meeting my co-writer, I had worked out an apartment block on the, the strand there in Bondi. But I decided that we would have the first teenage gay regular character in oh, a teenage soap. yeah, And the first regular character who was an Aboriginal kid in an Australian soap. They had been other characters, but they were wheeled in for a story, then wheeled out again. And that story so often with uh, gays and Indigenous is, yep. hey, this is the real me, or we don't accept you, or no, actually, you're okay, but then they leave. Yes. So we never <laughs> see them deal with <laughs> yeah. them on a regular basis, which is why Breakers deserves recognition for what it did, because you've got to go the distance with those characters. They aren't guest roles. Yeah, it's, and it's funny because, uh, stupidly, foolishly, uh, coming from a journalistic background, I thought, wait till the folks back home hear what I've done. So I phoned up my old newspaper in Glasgow, and they go, oh, Jimmy, what's the... Uh, What's, this, what's so special about this? And I said, wow, we've got this gay teenage character and, and we've got this uh, this Aboriginal character. And, I'm, and now you're proud of that, are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I feel really blessed that I've had this opportunity. The headline in the paper was, picture of me on my balcony holding a glass of champagne. <laughs> and the headline was, the man who wants to bring gay underage sex to afternoon TV. <sighs> they absolutely stitched me up. Wow. But what, that was a... I'm still very proud of that show. It was yeah. a great little show. Yeah. Um, and uh, a couple of actors came out of that. James Stewart, um, who's now quite well known. He, Correct. He was the original bad boy. Um, and then... Don Honey. Don Honey. You know, who also came, has become a superstar Yeah, since. so all these careers I launched yeah. with my gay, <laughs> gay It was a good sex. idea, but, but Bondi being so world-known, that was a great location for a show. But it was interesting because I watched you make that show just after... I'd been on the Gold Coast making Paradise Beach oh, and Pacific right. Drive yeah, set yeah. on the Gold Coast. Yeah, yeah. And I just remember feeling so sorry for you guys because up on the Gold Coast, we had a city council that would let us do anything, anywhere, anytime oh. for no charge. We could close Cavill Avenue, the main drag, block all the parking meters, park our trucks. They would let us do whatever we wanted because they understood that we were making a TV show that was going all over the world and was yeah. going to show yeah. their beaches. Yeah. They got it. And I remember at the time thinking, how much are they hitting you guys? Because I know at the time oh, they were, that they were, they were really killing you, weren't yeah. they? And, and they charged us an arm and a leg to, to shoot on location on Campbell Parade. Um, and then the day after we started shooting, they started digging up the pavement outside our hero building. Oh, Can you believe it? Wow. It's, it's, it's like somebody had, and we've gone back and said, well, we just paid all this money. Yeah. You know, so we can shoot here. And they said, well, you can shoot down there. Oh. But this is, this is our hero building. Yeah, you know, yeah. we've paid money. Yeah. To be able to, to shoot in and around this building. And, uh, yeah, the, the council was, it's like, yeah, we don't need any more people coming to Bondi. Thank you very mm. much. We've got enough. Next time, take that TV show to the Gold Coast. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you've just reminded me of it. I used to write for a, an entertainment news agency in London, um, and I, I wrote this piece, and I've mentioned Surfer's Paradise. 
said this person is from Sur Surfer's Paradise. And the sub-editor in London changed it to <laughs> a popular surfing spot. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a, a lack of awareness. Yeah. yeah. Now, what was the next cab off the rank? For? Well, the, the next part, it's funny, all these apartment block shows are all on the one network in Australia too, the uh, 10, 10 Network. The 10 Network, yeah. So that 10 went from number 96 to Breakers, and then they went to The Secret Life of Us. Oh, yeah, which was a classier, it has to be said, a yeah. classier operation altogether. Well, well they, yes, and, and they particularly did not like being referred to as a soap. No. They always said, we're a drama, we're a drama. And I was like, well, yeah, you are, and you're a great drama, but you know what? You've got continuing storylines. Yes. Why is soap such a dirty word? But yeah. anyway, Secret Life of Us was a great show. Claudia Carvin um, uh, was in Deborah that. Deborah Malman, was she? Deborah yeah. Malman, uh, Joel Edgerton. Yep. Uh, Samuel Johnson. The man with the voice, the man he, with the golden voice. Yeah, got some yeah. great actors in there. And I think... The interesting thing to come out of that was that Claudia Carvin, that's where it piked her interest in getting behind the camera. Yeah, and yeah. from there, she went to starring in and producing yeah. TV shows like Love My Way and yeah, Spirited. Yeah. And, you know, so now she's on both sides of the camera and, and is an extraordinary talent. Um, and she picked that all up filming an apartment. And that was, there was also. They couldn't decide whether or not to put that apartment block in Bondi or St Kilda. And I think from memory, it came down to what the local council was going to charge really? in terms of, I think. Right. Right. Although I say that, I think, because so often we know that when if a TV show has a choice between filming in Sydney and Melbourne, you go with Melbourne because you know that the Melbourne TV audience will support that They're very show. very parochial. Sydney won't do that, no. but Melbourneites will. They won't. actually used to put on posters in Melbourne, shot in Melbourne, yeah. on the poster, yeah, so that people would know that. And it's still true to this day. That's why the block is always in Melbourne. Yeah. I keep saying to them, why aren't you moving to the block to the Gold Coast? Surely, with all the bikini and everyone in the, in the beach. Surely it would be a sexier show up there, but they're staying in Melbourne because that's where the audience is. Yeah, very much And so. that's where the property sales are, of course, to get that big a mega million dollar finish too. Yes. Well, there's nothing needs fixed on the Gold Coast. They should, they should do a, a renovation show here in Sydney. <laughs> you know, my, my apartment block is falling down. Come would it, and, would come it and stay fix up it? long enough for the duration of the show? Well, that would be question. the problem. Yeah. yeah. You know, when they, when they bring the hammer down and the auction and then the thing yeah. falls apart. Then we had the older version, I think, of Breakers. Wonderland. Wonderland. So yeah. this is the last one that Ten did recently, and this was set at Coogee, and always used to amuse me because I lived at Coogee for a while, and there's no surf at Coogee. So every time one of those guys said, I'm just going to go have a surf and set off with their board down to Coogee Beach, I'd always be going, what are you going to surf on, mate? Yeah. There's no yeah. surf yeah. there. <laughs> But, you know, people in television don't know those notice. little local things. But my issue with Wonderland was that it was a show that was trying to be too nice. Yes. And I sometimes think, particularly if you're going to be in a late 8.30 p.m. primetime time slot, yeah. be a bit edgy. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I never like it when they play it safe. Like you, you would being edgy with breakers and pushing the boundaries of what that time slot was back then. You know, that so, caused a whole, huge problem for us because it was always going to be an afternoon show here. But then, I don't know if it's still the case, restrictions on TV were when the kids were at school, you could have anything. Yeah. But as soon as the schools were out, you were back on to PG or yeah. whatever. The show was bought by the BBC for an afternoon show. We said it's an afternoon teen soap. And they said, oh, great. We, Meaning lunchtime afternoon. After lunch. After lunch. Yeah. But before the kids come home but from school. But before the kids come yeah. home from school. We didn't realise that in Britain the restrictions were the whole day until oh. the evening. Ah. Oh. So we had this fantastically edgy, aren't we clever thing, and the, the Brits are going, we can't show this yeah. in this time slot. And eventually I think it ended up in, it was a late night 
thing on Channel 10, but that's probably got more. Well, to Channel do. 10 used to screen it twice, uh, no, they if did. you remember. They, they would screen it at, at, in the afternoon at 3.30 or 4.30, yeah. and then they would be playing it late at night, um, which was a, a similar strategy to what Pacific Drive ended up doing. Pacific Drive started off as a late night show on 9, then they started repeating it during the day yeah. and discovered, oh, it's rating better in the day, and the same thing. Then they started going, hang on, we got what well, we've got this HIV positive of girl and this lesbian no 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 <laughs> clean, clean it all up she's bisexual and she's on medication now and we never need to talk about that again it's going to be a daytime show and by then of course yeah it's, it's and everyone's going what yeah yeah absolutely interestingly enough with wonderland the head writer and creator is sarah walker yep she was one of my major writers on breakers when i looked at the the outline of wonderland i thought this is just breakers yeah for grown-ups yeah I th- I th- Sarah, you could Sarah, you could have given me a call. <laughs> it would have been nice to have had a glass of wine at the launch. <laughs> yes, but uh, she's—I mean, she's done well, uh, terrifically well. But yeah, Wonderland was a bit kind of—it was just nice, yeah, and just a little bit forgettable because it was so nice. <laughs> you know, and there were a couple of times in the story that was—you know—there's good cast and all of that stuff. A couple of times I was like going, "Oh, sorry, though, I don't." Go harder. These uh, I'm not buying that. These are the the story. I remember once there was a one of the big storylines. There was a couple and they'd been together forever, and then she was having an affair with the local barista, and the marriage was in tatters, and the the guy was heartbroken, and he then he met this female surfer who surfed like him, and they had this massive connection, and he'd split up with his wife, and of course one night they fell into a kiss, and he he broke away, and he said, No, I can't do this. I still respect my ex-wife too much. And what? I was like, please, <laughs> you're an Australian surfy male. Yeah. You'd have done her on the bonnet of the car in real life. <laughs> and here we are. You, we can do that. It's 8.30 at night. Yeah. Why are you making him out to be so freaking heroic and nice? It doesn't make for good TV. No. It's uh, and it's not real. I, I, I don't think people are necessarily looking to be shocked or surprised, but they're looking for real. They want authentic now. Yeah. You've got to be authentic. You got to, they, they want to be able to believe in the characters. So have we covered the entire... We haven't talked about The Heights. Oh, The Which Heights. is the last one. It's now airing on the ABC. Here's another ridiculous programming story. A story. Another show that was made in half-hour episodes to, to be stripped four or five nights a week. Yes. What do the ABC do with it? They decide to air it at 8.30pm on Friday nights. Two episodes back-to-back, meaning two opening credits every hour and two closing credits. And they've got to do that because there's different actors and crew on of different course, blocks. Yeah. So it's so ridiculous because the show is written to have these 30 minute cliffhanger endings and here they are airing it but having said that the show is so well done i think it's got its fans out there yeah 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 abc very cleverly put all 16 episodes or 32 episodes online for people to watch i think it's a fantastic show a really diverse show and i think what's great about it is that they have set it in a housing commission apartment yeah i love that right and the people make jokes in the show about oh you're povo you live in that building and they (laughs) and the characters talk about how the building has a bad reputation for being lower working class but cleverly They've put other characters in the gentrified, you know, townhouses yeah, around yeah, yeah. it. So you have these nice sets from the people with a bit more money yeah. and everyone very aware of the gulf between rich and poor. And it's a, a brilliant, brilliant, diverse show. And I'll also say, too, that it's as it's almost as diverse as it's just a little bit more diverse than Neighbours is at the moment. Right. Neighbours has really embraced where we are in 2019. Ah. The one show on TV that's still remains locked in the past with their all white cast is home and away yeah but yeah. you can how, you can how, look how at strange because it's it was the bright new kid on the yeah. block wasn't it but you can look at neighbors now and you can look at the heights now and i i would put those in time capsules and say in 20 years time you take them out and that's how australia was in 2019 which is yeah. what i think you can say about number 96 in the 70s yeah yeah um and i think it's important that you go we're making this show now but if you look back at this in years time will it look dated or will it reflect 
the period. And some shows do that better than others. I bump into Marcus Graham quite often at the gym. And it's funny because I always say, hello, how's it going? You know, great show. Yeah. And I could see him looking at me going, who the hell are you? Yeah. Get, a, get away from me. <laughs> I, and, you know, which he would spend a lot of his time doing. But, but you know, if but, I saw Marcus Graham walking down the street too, I would stop him and say, The Heights is a fantastic show. There you go. Well done. Because that's how good it is. I think it's really important to, to say to everyone in that show, you haven't just made a little bit of diversion. Yeah. We make good Australian TV shows and we make mediocre ones, but there are some outstanding ones. And this year, one of the top Australian dramas on TV has been The Heights. Yeah, I reckon. And uh, it's just good. I mean, he's such a good actor. Yeah. I mean, they obviously decided they were going to make quality to begin with. Yeah. And uh, and it sounds like they've, they've done, apart from the programming. Yes, apart from the programming, it's a great show. Yeah. That was TV historian, journalist, broadcaster and writer Andrew Mercado. And when we sat down to do this podcast, we were going to try and fit in a thing about movies and a thing about television uh, and get it all in half an hour. And obviously, there's so much to talk about. There's no way that's going to happen. So you've heard about the the TV aspect of living in apartments. Uh, Next week, we're going to talk about apartments in movies, or I should say movies in apartments. If you enjoy these podcasts, please subscribe and give us a rating if you can, especially if you like it. And if you want to know more about apartment living, come to flat-chat.com.au where you can ask questions or even answer other people's questions. So thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the first part of our look at apartments on screen. We'll be back next week with a look at apartments in the movies. I'm Jimmy Thompson. I'll talk to you then.